Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us again today. Uh, let me give you the daily statistics as usual. First of all, um, I can report that the total number of positive cases uh, that were reported yesterday was 697, which is 12.8% of people newly tested. And the total number of positive cases now is 32,906. 242 of these cases are in Greater Glasgow and Clyde. 145 in Lothian and 130 in Lanarkshire. The remaining 180 cases are spread across nine other health board areas. I can also confirm that 218 people are in hospital. That's an increase of eight since yesterday and 22 people are in intensive care now, which is the same number as yesterday. And finally, in the past 24 hours, no deaths have been registered of patients who first tested positive over the previous 28 days. But since this is a Monday, I will give the usual caveat. Uh, registration offices tend to be closed on Sundays, uh, so it's not entirely uh, unexpected that no deaths were registered yesterday. Since the last briefing we had on Friday, though, four additional deaths have been registered. Um, they've been reported in our daily figure since then. Um, and that means that the total number of deaths under the measurement we use on a daily basis is now 2,530. Uh, that total reminds us again that this virus can have a deadly impact. And of course, I want to pass my condolences again to everyone who has lost someone. Over the weekend and again today, uh, we've reported quite significant numbers of new cases. Um, that's obviously a cause for concern, and I'm going to say a little bit more about that shortly. Um, I'll then hand over to the Health Secretary, who's going to say a few words about the seasonal flu vaccination programme. Uh, before that, though, there are a couple of brief updates I want to provide you with. Uh, the first actually relates to an issue that uh, you will have heard emerged last week in some of these daily updates and it regards parent and baby groups. As you know, concerns were raised about the fact that the new restrictions limited attendance at these groups to just five adults and it was felt that that had a disproportionate impact on the ability of these groups to run and therefore a disproportionate impact on the well-being and the mental health of new mums in particular um, and babies. I said last week that we would look again at this issue um, and inform our consideration, as we always do, by clinical advice. And I can confirm that we've now done so and the guidance has been updated. We've now increased the number of adults that can attend uh, parent and baby groups so long as other health and safety criteria are met. And in summary, if you are interested in this and if there are groups you attend, you can find the full guidance on our website. But in summary, it means that where babies are under 12 months old, up to 10 adults can now be present at any one time in these groups. Though where children are over 12 months, we're still asking that the maximum number of adults uh, is five. We know that parent and baby groups are vital in supporting health and well-being, particularly at the moment. But we also know that any setting where groups of adults come together poses a risk of transmission. So what we hope is that this change, while I'm sure not satisfying everybody, will strike a better balance between supporting the well-being uh, of new parents and in particular supporting perinatal mental health, uh, while also making sure that we are taking appropriate steps to try to stop the virus spreading. My second update today is to draw attention to improvements in our presentation of COVID data. And from a glance at social media last night, I see that some of you have already uh, seen this new information and have already been making use of it. Uh, Public Health Scotland has updated the dashboard that is published on its website and it now provides additional COVID information and it tries to provide all of the information in a more accessible format. For example, it now allows you to see additional data about the state of the pandemic, not just at a national Scotland-wide level, but at a much more local level as well. Up until now, the dashboard used local data to colour code local authority areas based on the proportion of neighbourhoods that had a certain number of cases uh, per 100,000 uh, over a seven-day period. But we know from information requests that there is a desire, very understandable desire, for people to have more localised information. So the updated dashboard provides that option. Uh, by selecting your local authority, you can now click on the local area map to see case numbers 
within your neighbourhood. Um, and a neighbourhood is typically an area with around 4,000 residents. So it gives you access to uh, more information about the number of cases and the level of infection, not just across your local authority, but actually in the neighbourhood you live in. And I think that, uh, I hope that will be useful for people in trying to assess uh, risk as we move forward. Another new feature is a chart that shows the changing age profile of those testing positive. And at the moment, that chart illustrates the trend that we've been talking about in recent weeks, where we've been seeing more young people testing positive than we did at the start of the pandemic back in the spring. However, um, and this is a really important point and actually one of the key points in our consideration of next steps in the, the days uh, to come, this chart also shows uh, something that is concerning us, which is a rise now in transmission amongst older age group. And it underlines the fact that this resurgence of COVID, as it is in many countries, is affecting people across the different age groups. So I would encourage anybody who's interested to take a look at this new dashboard. Um, I think it will help people to understand the course of the pandemic, not just across the country, but particularly in your local area and how it is affecting different demographics of the population. Now, before I hand over to the Health Secretary, um, and then she, I, and the Chief Medical Officer uh, take questions, I want to return briefly to the large number of cases that we have seen reported over the weekend and you know, the large number of cases that we have been seen, uh, being seen reported over uh, the last couple of weeks. Uh, this is further evidence that in Scotland, as it is in many countries uh, right across the UK, the Republic of Ireland and uh, across Europe, uh, COVID is on the rise again uh, as countries have come out of lockdown and importantly, as we enter the winter period. And of course, we're seeing the consequences of that, not just in the daily case numbers, but also, and perhaps more importantly, in the rise of hospital admissions, in the numbers of people in intensive care, and sadly, in the number of people who are dying from the virus. So all of that means that it is vital that we do everything we can to get this situation under control. Of course, in a proportionate way that allows us to take account of all of the different harms, not just that COVID can do, but that our ways of dealing with COVID can also do. The restrictions we announced a couple of weeks ago, particularly uh, that request to everybody not to visit other people's houses right now, uh, is an attempt to get the virus under control. And we are very hopeful that it will help us stem the increase of the virus over uh, the next period. But given the numbers we're seeing, uh, we are, and I've been very open about this over the past few days, it is possible that we will have to do more. Uh, there may well be a need for some further restrictions in the near future. Uh, I can say that the government will be considering the latest clinical evidence and advice later on today, and the cabinet will be considering the up-to-date situation when it meets tomorrow morning. If we do decide more restrictions are necessary, and no decision has been taken yet, uh, I want to give an assurance that we will endeavour to give you, the public, and of course, the Scottish Parliament, as much notice as possible, as well as a clear explanation of our reasons and rationale. And I want to promise you uh, that we do not impose restrictions lightly. Um, if we decide that extra restrictions are necessary, it will be because we deem it necessary and vital to get the virus back under control and avoid unnecessary loss of life. But for now, uh, pending any decisions that may be taken and communicated over the next uh, few days, the best thing all of us can do to try to stop this resurgence and bring transmission back under control is comply with the current guidelines and uh, rules that are in place. So as usual today, I want to end by reminding everybody what they are. Uh, as I uh, mentioned a moment ago, and this is the toughest restriction at the moment, I know, but none of us should be visiting each other's homes uh, right now, except, of course, for very, very specific purposes, if you need to care for a, a vulnerable relative or if you have childcare uh, responsibilities. Uh, when people are meeting outdoors or in indoor public places, we are asking you to uh, limit the size of the group uh, that you're in to a maximum of six people and to ensure that those six people don't come from any more than two households. That's a key way of making sure that we limit transmission from one household to another. 
And in addition, please work from home if it is possible for you to do so and download the Protect Scotland app if you haven't already done so. It's an important way of making sure that anybody who is exposed to the virus gets quick notification of the need to self-isolate if that is appropriate and it allows us to uh, capture more people in that test and protect uh, scheme than we would otherwise be able to do. And finally, remember facts, the basic but really important rules that underpin our approach to tackling this virus right now. Wear face coverings when you're out and about. The law says you have to do it in certain places like shops, public transport, but my advice would be to wear face coverings when you're out and about as often as you can. Uh, avoid crowded places, uh, whether they are indoor or outdoor crowded places. Don't forget to clean your hands and to clean hard surfaces that you or other people might be touching. Two metre distance is what you should be seeking to keep uh, from people in households other than your own. And of course, self-isolate and book a test straight away if you experience any of the symptoms of COVID, which to remind everybody, uh, those symptoms we're asking you to be alert for are a fever, a new cough or a loss of or change in your sense of taste or smell. Keeping to these rules, I know is tough. It requires all of us to be much more conscious of our uh, everyday behaviour than we would normally be. And it's a massive inconvenience. I absolutely understand that. But right at this moment, it is more essential than it has been possibly at any time since before we went into lockdown back in March, that all of us are really vigilant and take all of these basic, and I know in some respects quite difficult steps to stop this virus running away from us again. Uh, so please uh, try to do all of this. And as I said earlier on, uh, we will keep you informed if there are more uh, steps that we feel we need to take over the period to try to pull uh, things back under control before we go deeper into winter. Thank you very much for listening. I'll hand over now to the Health Secretary before the three of us take questions as usual. Thank you very much, First Minister. Every year, the seasonal flu vaccine programme is important, but this year it is even more so as we work to suppress COVID-19. The programme already covers those who are over 65, those under 65 with underlying health conditions, NHS staff, pregnant women, unpaid and young carers, and children both aged two to five and those in primary school. The seasonal flu programme is a critical part of our public health effort. So that is why, in light of the COVID-19 virus, we have significantly expanded free eligibility to now include social care workers who provide direct care, household members of those who are advised to shield, and those aged 55 and over who are not otherwise covered. This means that the expansion uh, means that we will be aiming to vaccinate two and a quarter million people, a 50% increase over previous years. To do that means a system-wide effort and changes to how you will get your vaccine. Our NHS boards are leading the delivery with walk-in and drive-through centres, using GP practices as before, but also other locations, all tailored to suit local circumstances. And wherever you do go for your vaccine, there will be additional infection prevention and control measures that are in place to protect you and the staff. We do have enough vaccine for everyone who is eligible. And by delivering the programme nationwide in two phases, we are prioritising those most at risk from harm. Now, as we completely but necessarily change how we get the vaccine to you, there may be some glitches but we're working very closely every single day with each health board to spot these and fix them as quickly as we can. You can find out more information, how you will be invited for your vaccine appointment and what you need to do from NHS Inform's website or by calling NHS 24 on the free phone number 0800 22 4488. If you're eligible, then when you get your letter telling you about your appointment and what to do, please make every effort to be vaccinated. It really does protect you and it helps all of us. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Jean. I'll move now straight to questions. Uh, Glenn Campbell from the BBC. Good afternoon, First Minister. I have a question for you and one for the Health Secretary. Uh, to the Health Secretary, we've been hearing today from someone 
who was told to self-isolate by the Protect Scotland app because he lives in the flat below confirmed cases, people that he's had no contact with. How many of these false alerts have there been and how big a problem might that be for the operation of this system? And to you, First Minister, um, I wonder, in light of what you've just said, how seriously you're considering a so-called circuit breaker as part of the look at new restrictions. And has the Prime Minister agreed to your request for further Four Nations talks on additional restrictions? And if not, has he offered you more financial flexibility to go your own way? OK, I'll uh, answer the question to me and then um, Jean will address the question you uh, addressed to her. Um, on the issue of what might or might not transpire over the, the course of the week, um, I know that this term circuit breaker has started to be used as a shorthand and you know we've contributed to that as well. But of course, I think what will be more important in terms of our decision making and then in communicating whatever decisions we take is what actually um, the, the components of that are. You know, a circuit breaker um, could mean a lot of different things. And so what we are looking at is what further restrictions may be necessary to get the virus back under control. So uh, that could be um, a, a number of different things. Um, but equally, um, it's not... Uh, it, could well be that a number of different things are not included and it's not something that is anything like the lockdown that we had in March. So um, we, we, are, we have some uh, considerations this afternoon where uh, I and clinical advisors will look at the current state of the epidemic. We will look at the, the geography of the spread, we'll look at the demographics of the spread. I will hear from Gregor and Jason and others what they think might be required um, and why they think these particular steps might be required. And if we decide on further restrictions, obviously I'll set that out to Parliament and we'll set it out to the, the public. So I know why people talk about a circuit breaker, but it's one of these terms that I think different people use to mean a whole range of different things. And I think it will be important for us whether people then if we do take decisions, people might then still choose to call it a circuit breaker, but I think it's important we focus on the components uh, that would form uh, the uh, part of any package of measures that we might choose to take. And I think it's really important that we do that in a, an orderly and, and systematic way. Um, on the uh, Four Nations point, um, I had a call with Michael Gove last week on the back of the letter I sent to the Prime Minister um, and... Uh, no decisions were taken there, but I pressed the point about the need to have uh, access to financial interventions that match the, the scale of the public health interventions that we may all be uh, requiring to take. There was an agreement that the Scottish Government would put forward some uh, further proposals and that there would be further Four Nations discussions about that. So there is a, a process that we are trying to engage in there. Um, more widely, um, I think just for us to share uh, views on where we are and, and what might transpire over the next few days, there is a Four Nations call again um, that Michael Gove will be convening uh, later on this afternoon. But I imagine that will be to discuss the, the wider uh, situation, not simply on uh, the issues of finance. Um, Jean. Th thanks very much. Uh, I'm, I'm obviously, I'm not aware of the particular uh, instance that you're telling me about there, Glenn. If, if details can be passed on to me, then I'm very happy to have a look at it. But let's remember how Test and Protect works. So we are informed of uh, the contact traces of people working in Test and Protect are informed of a positive case, they contact that positive case and they talk to them about where they've been, who they've been with, what they have been doing, and that gives them then the information they need to follow through to identify who might have been close contacts. In some instances, we don't know who would have been our close contacts because we, we were in a restaurant or we were uh, in a public place, we, we don't know that. All the more reason then why downloading the Protect Scotland app is really important because that gives that information, but also why it's really important to give our contact details if we go, for example, to a restaurant. Um, so that's how Test and Protect works. And they make um, decisions based on significant number of years experience and expertise to determine what is a close contact, who is a close contact, then get in touch with that person and ask them to isolate and obviously if they develop symptoms to book a test themselves. So that's how the system works. In this particular instance, as I say, I, I don't know the details, but I'm very happy to look at that 
to see if in this instance there has been a false alert. Uh, I'm not aware of any significant number of false alerts at all. Our test and protect system is working really very well indeed, but it needs all of us to comply with it to help it do that. We will look into that point, though, as uh, Cabinet Secretary said. It, it shouldn't be the case that the app alerts somebody whose only contact has been through a wall or in a, a downstairs flat. But one of the one of the benefits of Test and Protect, uh, the app rather, is that it, it can uh, identify us when we don't know we've had other contacts. So it could be that somebody might think that their only contact has been, I'm not saying that's the case here, but that they might think they've had no contact with somebody other than living downstairs or upstairs for them, but in actual fact, they maybe have. They've maybe you know, crossed paths somewhere else. But we will look into that and just make sure that there is not uh, an issue there with uh, alerts that should not be uh, given to people. Uh, Kay Nicholson from STV. Thank you, First Minister. You mentioned there the geography of the spread. Obviously, there are some hot spots we're seeing in the local breakdown of more than 100 cases per 100,000 population. But then, of course, in other areas, there is a rate of zero. Given that variation, are any potential future restrictions you're looking at this week considering um, to be blanket across the country? Or would you look at potential kind of regional lockdowns or, or variations on the restrictions. I'm going to hand over to Gregor in a second just to say a little bit about the geographic uh, spread of the virus. But just to cut to the chase of your question, that will be one of the key considerations. You know, if, if we feel there are further restrictions needed, are they needed nationwide or are they needed on a, a local or regional basis? And we haven't taken a decision on that yet. What I would say is that although we are seeing in uh, West Central Scotland and in Lothian, so you know, Health Board Wise, Greater Glasgow and Clyde, at Lanarkshire and Lothian, uh, particularly high numbers of cases and levels of infection, it would be wrong to suggest that we are not seeing rise in infection in pretty much every part of the country. Um, we are. In fact, if I look at today's cases, and you know, I usually give the caveat that you should always be careful about looking at a single day's cases, but this has been the case on uh, most days over the past uh, week or so. Uh, we have cases in every mainland health board area and over the past few days we've also seen cases in the western isles i think last week we had cases in shetland so there is a rising uh, tide of infection across the country albeit it is higher in some parts than in others and part of our consideration about restrictions is also also requires to take account of not just reacting to a problem that is already there but also are you wiser to take preventative action in areas where uh, it might not look as if there is as big a problem right now, but if you act, you can stop that problem uh, developing. But that will be one of uh, the many things we're looking at over the course of the, the next couple of days. It's really important that as we're looking at all the data that comes into us is that we're not focusing too much on just one area. It would be very easy just now to be drawn to the central belt of Scotland where we see such a rise in cases, uh, particularly in Lanarkshire, in Glasgow and in Lothian areas. And if we were to do that, we might miss the signs that we're seeing from across the country of rising cases in those areas as well. Because over the last two weeks, the National Incident Management Team has been meeting essentially on a daily basis to discuss this data as it comes in. And what we're seeing is a gradual rise in cases, not only in that central belt, but actually in other areas of Scotland as well, where the test positivity rate has begun to increase in those areas. And on the test positivity data today shows a number of the areas in Scotland uh, where it's currently sitting above 5%. So it's not just about absolute cases, it's the proportion of cases that are testing positive as well. And when we start to do an analysis of the age ranges that are associated with those positive cases, initially what we were seeing was that there was certainly a, the bulk of the cases were in those younger age groups, but we are starting to see that move into older age groups. Now, that's demonstrated most clearly, I think, in the data that we're seeing from Lanarkshire just now, which has doubled the prevalence of cases in the 45 to 64-year-old age group than the rest of the country. But when we take Lanarkshire out the equation and look at the data from across Scotland just now, we can see that same tracking, that same movement into those older age groups across the country just now. One of the things I think we've got to be careful to do here is not allow our perspective to shift and become 
too relative, because if I look at some of the health boards today that, relatively speaking right now, have a lower number of cases and a lower positivity rate, you know, so a, a health board, Dumfries and Galloway, just to take it as an example, you know, 4.1% positivity um, with a small number of cases today, um, and it's one day's data, I should say, but because we're looking at that right now, compared to Greater Glasgow and Clyde, which is, you know, 16 percent positivity, the temptation is to say Dumfries and Galloway is not a problem. But if I, you know, cast our minds back a month, if I stood up here and said that any health board had a positivity rate of 4.1 percent, we'd all be saying, oh my goodness, that is terrible, we need to act. So we shouldn't allow, you know, all, all areas of Scotland right now are at a higher level of infection than we would be comfortable with and that we would have been comfortable with a, a month or so ago. So it's important that we don't allow ourselves to become complacent about the areas that right now are relatively lower because in a, a more absolute sense, they are still higher than we probably uh, would want them to be. So all of these things have to be considered. Peter McMahon from ITV Border. Uh, thank you, First Minister. Uh, First Minister, um, re responding to some comments that uh, Jason Leach men, uh, made, which uh, were interpreted as a, 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 a circuit breaker, he talked about a short, sharp shock. Uh, Colin Smith, MSP, who's a Labour MSP for the South of Scotland, says on social media, this sums up the democratic deficit in Scottish politics. Decisions made on such a profound impact on the lives of our constituents via a nod and a wink from officials in the press or via Twitter, no parliamentary scrutiny whatsoever, just in case we dare ask questions. Um, is Colin Smith right or is he wrong? And what would you, how would you respond to that? Uh, no, I, I don't think he is right. Uh, and I particularly don't necessarily think, you know, that is a fair way of expressing things, but... At the heart of his comment, I do concede that there is a, a, a legitimate issue there, um, which is that we want to make sure that if we are having to apply more restrictions, then we give the public as much notice as possible and also give Parliament uh, as much notice and as much input into that as possible. And, and that's what I would hope we would do this week. Um, I would balance that simply by reminding people that this is a virus we are dealing with here and, and governments do have the... The responsibility and the obligation to to make the tough decisions and you know i these, these decisions are not ones that anybody should relish or, or particularly want to be in the position of taking right now um so you know if i thought i could offload them to somebody else maybe uh, there, there'd be a t temptation there. so we have to take decisions it's not a nod and a wink we, we're going through as we have done all along a careful process of trying to understand the data understand the evidence, then from that decide what measures might or might not make a difference and, and have a positive impact on that evidence. None of, of this is easy. Uh, but as we go much further into this, I think everybody accepts and wants to see a greater degree of uh, parliamentary involvement and scrutiny. And, you know, with the caveat that governments in a situation like this always have to reserve the right to act very quickly if the judgment is health and life might depend on it i would hope that if if and i i keep stressing if because we haven't taken decisions yet if we were to decide that some kind of package of measures that people might describe as a circuit breaker are necessary then we will be able to set these out over the course of this week that does give parliament uh, some input into that decision which i would certainly be uh, keen to see if it is possible Alan Smith from Burr. Thanks, First Minister. A question for the Health Secretary, if I may, in regards to flu vaccinations. Uh, Radio Clyde has spoken with a GP in Bridgeton who says he has 1,200 patients who are now eligible for flu vaccinations, but he's only received 300 doses of the vaccination. And he's concerned about you know, possible delays in getting the rest of what he needs in time for peak flu season. Is there any guarantees you can offer in terms of when GPs can receive the, the, the full number of vaccines they'll need and, and can they get that in time for peak season? So the, the flu vaccines themselves are made by uh, a number of different manufacturers and their delivery dates come to us at different times. We procure vaccine ourselves as the Scottish Government and we also take part in the Four Nation UK procurement. And all of that is timed not only to make sure that we get the right volume of vaccines at the right time, uh, but also that we have overlaps where we can possibly do that as a safety 
uh, a safety measure, if you like, to make sure that we do have enough uh, vaccines to go to all the places where we will be vaccinating people. And that isn't only into the GP surgery. So I, again, I, I don't know the particular detail of the practice in Bridgeton that um, is raising this concern, but it may be that not all of those patients who are eligible will be getting vaccinated through their GP practice. And the reason for that is uh, one of the reasons why we've had to change the way we deliver it this year. Uh, not only is there a 50% increase in the number of people we want to vaccinate, but we've also got the COVID virus, which means that we need additional infection prevention and control measures. Uh, so we can't have large numbers of people waiting in the GP surgery on the Saturday uh, to be vaccinated as we've done it before perfectly safely, but we didn't have COVID-19. So we've had to uh, introduce a whole range of different locations for us to go and get at the vaccine if we're eligible. That includes certainly GP surgeries, but they will be doing fewer than they have done in previous years because we need to spread that out in order to make sure that we've got the right infection prevention measures in place. So again, if there are particular problems in any GP surgery or with any health board about worrying that they don't have enough uh, vaccine supply, again, if we know about that, we can intervene and resolve that or reassure them that there is vaccine supply on its way to them uh, before what they have has already been used. Thanks. Uh, Fraser Knight from Global. Thank you, First Minister. You've spoken about potentially giving people advance notice of any new restrictions which may come in in Scotland this week. Um, there have been some suggestions that a so-called circuit breaker lockdown could take part, take place at the same time as the school holidays in October, which for some start next week. So just wondering how much advance notice do you think you will, will be giving people for this or how, how much do you aim to give people? And if I can as well, the Welsh Government's just said that they're actively considering imposing quarantine restrictions on people travelling to Wales from parts of the UK where infection rates are particularly high. Is this something that the Scottish Government's also considering as well? I've not seen the uh, comments of the Welsh Government. I will, um, in the context of Four Nations discussions, obviously speak to Matt Drake for this afternoon, so that may be something that he uh, expands upon there. Obviously, uh, travel um, will be uh, both within Scotland and from Scotland to other places will be part of a consideration of whether additional measures uh, might be required of that nature but I don't want to go further than our decision making has reached yet. In uh, response to your question how much notice, I, I know this is not a particularly helpful answer but it's probably the, the best one I can give as much as possible. Um, we're trying to balance a situation here uh, which with a, an infectious virus that is you know, circulating and spreading quickly, you have to act quickly if you think action is necessary. On the other hand, recognising that people, particularly after seven months of disruption to their lives, need as much time as possible. So we'll try to get that balance right. And I would certainly hope that we could give, you know, a, 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 at least a couple of days notice of, of any restrictions that we're going to kick in. Obviously, we want to keep schools. Open schools are about to go into holiday uh, October holiday period. Different local authorities have different holiday periods. We want to avoid, you know, changing school holidays. But there is also an opportunity over uh, this next couple of weeks, two to three weeks in October, of course, uh, when not all schools are necessarily off at exactly the same time. But you know, there'll be periods where most schools are off, and that perhaps give an gives an opportunity to try to reduce some of the transmission risks uh, that we face. Not in schools because we believe schools are safe to be back, but that go round about uh, schools. So obviously that's all part of the consideration and the decision-making process that we're engaged in just now. Uh, Katrine Bussey from PA. Hello, First Minister. I wanted to ask a couple of things about, about the numbers. Um, looking at today's statistics, it seems that still by far the greatest number of new cases are in the Greater Glasgow and Clyde Health Board region. And yet Glasgow is one of the areas that's had these tighter lockdown restrictions in place for longest. It was previously said that these restrictions were thought to be starting to have an impact. And I just wondered if that was still the case. And also, if I may, um, it emerged last night that the UK government had failed to add 
some 18,000 new cases onto its daily total of, of tests. And I just wondered, in light of that, have similar, have any checks been done in Scotland to make sure that we haven't missed any cases of the total? Okay, on the first question, I'll, I'll hand over substantively to Gregor. What I would say there is, is really what we have said over the past week or so. We did believe that the restrictions in Glasgow, uh, or the parts of Greater Glasgow and Clyde more generally, um, around household uh, interactions, where the term I think that we've used was blunting the, the growth of cases. So it wasn't sending them yet into decline, but had slowed down the rate of increase. Uh, we... I think there would be a reasonable uh, basis for optimism that that is still uh, happening, uh, particularly uh, the longer we go with these restrictions. But what has complicated the data picture, of course, are outbreaks at universities. And, and Glasgow University had a particularly big outbreak, which will be impacting on the number. So it makes it more difficult just to uh, you know, differentiate the different uh, strands of that uh, there. Um, on the... Uh, Gregor will no doubt want to expand on the numbers there on the data issue uh, that has affected public health England um, obviously I've been uh, anxious over the weekend to make sure that there was no impact of that on Scotland's figures and to the best of my knowledge there is no impact on uh, Scotland's figures um, from the the data uh, issue in England um, as I understand it this is a, an issue that has been uh, caused by some kind of malfunction in a public health England computer system uh, so therefore it, it is not a computer system that we use here. Um, the other thing that gives me assurance um, although you know obviously we look at the data all the time and just to check that there's nothing in it that looks odd to us but actually one of the things that was looking odd to me last week as I looked at the daily uh, numbers was that England looked quite low. Um, if you looked at Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland cases, it looked as if uh, England was significantly, or maybe not significantly, but a bit below proportionately where the rest of us were. And that didn't seem to make sense to me, although we were thinking about why that might be the case. I, I did an interview on the, the Robert Peston show on Wednesday night where I was speculating about the things that might explain that. But actually, when you look at the revised English figures now with the, uh, the modifications that happened over the weekend, that doesn't look as odd anymore. It looks as if the, the, the figures between the four nations are much more explicable and, and credible. So that would also give me a level of assurance that you know, there, there is nothing untoward. We have no reason to believe there is anything untoward in the Scottish figures. But on a daily basis, we uh, look at uh, pour over these figures and for a whole variety of different reasons and a whole variety of different ways. When we look at the Glasgow figures, what we're looking at is the rate of increase in particular in, in, in Glasgow over time. The National uh, Incident Management Team pours over this data on a daily basis, trying to examine and see where the trend is developing with those figures and comparing it to what was expected. Because we recognise that the growth rates for this are fairly predictable. And when we look at the observed number of cases compared to those that we would expect according to those models, there's no doubt about it, there has been a blunting of those observed cases. There are fewer cases than we would necessarily have expected had those restrictions not been in place. What we've yet to see is a reversal of that process just now and a decline in those figures. So although it's certainly slowed down and has been containing some of the rate of growth in Glasgow, um, then we're not seeing a complete reversal of that. And as the First Minister has already said, that has been complicated by the increased number of positive cases that we've had with the, the student and younger people population uh, as, as higher education has returned. Now, in comparable terms, when we look at other areas of Scotland, what we still see across Scotland is a rise in cases. And we are certainly not seeing the steep rises in Glasgow that we've perhaps seen in some other areas of Scotland. But nonetheless, we need to continue to monitor that very closely to continually revisit whether there is anything more that needs to be done to try to prevent that rate of growth becoming um, much greater again. Um, Chris Masson from The Sun. Hi, First Minister. Um, just want to check, are you considering this um, circuit breaker within days primarily because it's October school break and furlough ends in three weeks rather than it being the optimum time scientifically? And um, you may have seen that two prominent lawyers in The Telegraph today suggested you have been waging a highly effective psychological fear project against the population is how they put it um, related to this. 
Many parents have been saying how lockdown affected their children's mental health. Do you worry that a circuit break, even for two weeks, with kids prevented from seeing each other and possibly switch to part-time schooling? Do you worry that this could be harmful to children psychologically? I have no proposal to switch children to part-time schooling. Um, and let me be very clear about that. This is... This is all about trying to manage this infection in a way that allows us to keep schools open other than scheduled holiday periods that we don't have either extended holidays or rescheduled holidays or a move to blended learning. So, you know, let, let me be very clear about that. The second point is when you're considering uh, measures, you have to, uh, I'm afraid it's just a, a feature of responsible decision making, you have to weigh up a lot of different issues. And, and of course, um, with... Uh, some of the kinds of restrictions that inevitably are in focus here, there are economic impacts to that, and that has to be part of the consideration. But I would not be uh, doing something as, uh, as, as vital as add extra restrictions that I didn't think was either the right thing to do or being done at an optimal time, because frankly, it would be counterproductive. Um, so yes, we take all of these different factors into account to come to a balanced decision, but it's got to be a balanced decision that has the desired effect of slowing down the spread of this virus and bringing it back under control, as well as trying to do it in a way that has that minimises the economic input, uh, impact and maximises the things we can do to mitigate that economic impact. But um, I wouldn't take decisions in the kind of crude um, way that you've described there. Um, I don't know whether to admit this uh, yet, Chris. I, I haven't read The Telegraph uh, yet this morning. Um, I'm not sure if the word yet there is maybe doing too much work. Uh, but I don't know who you're talking about uh, in terms of the, the people who've... Uh, made those comments in, in the Telegraph. What I would say is I don't underestimate the impact on mental health of everything that the country has been dealing with over these past seven months. Um, the, the mental health impact of living through a global pandemic and the worries everybody has for their health and well-being, but then the very real impact on mental health and well-being more generally and on people's financial and economic circumstances of, of the measures, the lockdown measures that have been necessary to uh, deal with that. So these are, uh, are issues that we we take very seriously. And, you know, I, I, I keep coming back to a point that is not intended to kind of avoid questions or scrutiny here. It's just to try to advance understanding that there is not, there are none of these decisions that are easy or straightforward or absolutely black and white. We are trying to manage a horrendously difficult situation uh, knowing that everything we do to try to manage that situation has consequences elsewhere. And we're trying to do that to the best of our ability and undoubtedly not always getting it right. I've tried to acknowledge that from day one, but trying to strike the best balances that we possibly can. And, and we'll keep trying to do that. Tom Peterkin from the PNJ. Uh, good afternoon, First Minister. Um, at a time when students are isolating in university halls, I wondered what you made of um, Aberdeen University Principal George Boyne's decision to stay with his son in Wales, which appears to have been against Welsh guidance, and with it, whether this was something you talked to him about or the university. I, I haven't had any conversations. I've, I saw a report of this this morning, it would obviously be a matter for the university to uh, look at if, if required. What I did see, and I've not had the chance to uh, get any more detail on this, is that it appears to have been a, a journey he made for a, a health reason. He was seeking some health consultation. I don't know more about it at this stage. If there is any suggestion of a breach of guidelines, I would expect the university to, to take that seriously, as I would always take that seriously. Um, and I would just take the opportunity to underline the fact that everybody, regardless of who they are, their position, their status, uh, we all have to follow these rules because they are there to keep all of us safe. And, you know, they don't apply to some people and not to others. And, you know, I made that clear in another context on Friday, and I would make it equally clear in this context as well. Tom Martin from the Daily Express. Hi, thank you, First Minister. I just wondered um, what's, what's test and protect or what the data is showing is the, is the biggest driver of this, what you say is the riding, rising tide of cases, given we've had, you know, in the west of Scotland, a ban on household visits for several weeks and a ban now, a, na a nationwide ban for two weeks. What, what's actually driving these numbers that you're seeing? 
I'll let Gregor um, say a bit more about this, but the, the key drivers will be the same as they have been throughout. The, 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 the contrib relative contributions that each of, of them are making may change, um, but it is still it's household interaction, although we should see that reduce given the restrictions that are now in place. It, it will be people interacting in other settings. Hospitality, for example, we would hope the 10 o'clock curfew would have an impact on that, although that is one of the areas where you know, just to be frank, we may have to go further for a period. Um, and then, of course, in the last couple of weeks, we've had the impact of university uh, outbreaks as well. But again, we would, you know, hope to see the, the restrictions and the, uh, the steps that have been taken there to have a, a positive impact. But, you know, generally it is people interacting. When we were all in, you know, strict lockdown, told not to leave our own houses except for essential purposes, the virus had very, very few opportunities to spread and therefore the, the, the levels of infection came down rapidly. It took a long time and it wasn't easy, but it happened. Now that we have significant aspects of life back to not normality, but a much greater degree of normality, the virus has got many more opportunities to spread. And, you know, sometimes there's a lot of complicated and, and very, you know, um, serious science behind all of this. But one of the things I, I've kind of learned over the past seven months is actually at its root, some of this is quite simple in how an infectious virus spreads from one person to another. And we shouldn't try to overcomplicate that because the way to stop it spreading is to limit those interactions and to take the precautions and the protections, whether that's hand hygiene or face coverings that protect you when you are interacting with another person. The test and protect teams, when they have their conversations, their interviews with people who have tested positive, they're looking for associations, places where those people may have been, where they could have come into contact with other people um, and, and for that virus to have transmitted. And over time, what we're still seeing is that there's still a strong likelihood of transmission within households from positive cases through the rest of their household that's there, but less so with other households in that environment. There's been a gradual shift both in the number of people that um, those are coming into contact with and also the types of venues as well. And as the National IMT begins to discuss this and understand the data that's there, what we're seeing, starting to see is stronger associations coming through with some other types of environments. So for instance, over the weekend, we looked at um, in a deep analysis of some of the cases, particularly in the west of Scotland, and a stronger association there coming through with workplaces, particularly the social spaces within workplaces, where people go for coffee or for lunch together, um, where we're seeing an association with um, shopping, and we were seeing an association with different types of hospitality venue as well. I think what this emphasises more than anything else is that all of us need to remain on our guard at all times and the simple measures that we can take whenever we're out and about that just reduce the likelihood of any transmission taking place. So whether you're in a, a restaurant or in a shop or even in a, the, the kind of social um, work spaces as well, is making sure that you're maintaining as much distance as possible from other people, making sure you're washing your hands or using sanitizer really regularly. And if you're seeing crowded spaces around the place, avoiding them because they're likely to be much riskier places for transmission. These are simple things that all of us can do on a daily basis just now. And, and you know, we, we just maybe perhaps need to reinforce to ourselves that those behaviours need to continue. Thanks. Uh, Scott McNabb from the Scotsman. Uh, yeah, thank you, um, First Minister. Um, can I just ask, maybe this is one for the Chief Medical Officer, but it's more about the logic behind the circuit breaker um, approach, because it does imply a temporary package of short, sharp measures. When maybe experience from earlier in the year shows us that when activity levels return back to normal, cases just rise again. So, so what would the benefits be of this? Yeah, I mean, I can answer that question. It's been something which has been discussed in great detail um, through some of the scientific advisory groups that are being advising. And when the papers initially were presented to SAGE in relation to what we've been called a temporal reset, other people have called a, a, a circuit breaker, one of the biggest advantages of applying these measures in a short, sharp way is that you both get a reduction in the rate of growth of cases but also, just as importantly, you get a reduction in the number of cases that you have in circulation at that point in time. So whilst you can reduce R to a level that perhaps slows that rate of growth and slows onward transmission, 
What you also do is you reduce the number of people who have that virus and it could then infect other people as well. So that further down the line, it slowed the, epide the, the, the kind of um, epidemic curve and you have much lower level of cases several weeks later than you would have done had you not had that reset as well. So it's two advantages are both to reduce the rate of growth by doing that in a short, sharp way and minimising the harm on other types of sectors, but also reducing the prevalence of the virus and the number of people who are infected as well at the same time. So if you like, I suppose, an analogy I would draw is why did we put so much focus over the summer on driving it to the lowest level possible? It's because we knew that when we started to open up again, it would start to circulate. And there is a big difference. And our number, correct me if I'm wrong here, Gregor, but in our number of 1.5 on a very, very low prevalence is a very different proposition to our, and our number of 1.5 on a much higher prevalence. So the lower you can get it, the more, you know, nobody wants to see spread, but the, 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 the less of a quickly running out of control problem it is if you're doing it on a very low base. So reducing that overall pool is really important. And particularly as we go into winter and, you know, buying some time that gets us through winter. And of course, in a, a virus, we were hoping at some point for there to be a vaccine. Um, you know, don't knock short-term measures that maybe give us time to, to suppress it while we're waiting on other things happening. Michael Blackley from the Daily Mail. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, we've been contacted by some elderly people who are unable to wear face masks for medical reasons, um, but are becoming increasingly anxious and stressed about perceptions of other people and their, their reasons for not wearing it. Um, is there any reassurance that you can pro provide and are, are there any schemes that you might consider um, to, to deal with this, this problem? Um, and also on Margaret Ferrier, um, House of Commons records show that the Patrick Grady, the chief whip of the SNP, agreed last Monday to be a proxy voter for her as part of that scheme which is available to MPs who can't attend the Commons because of medical or public health reasons related to the pandemic. Um, are you confident that Patrick Grady and the SNP at Westminster did enough to determine the reasons for for that and um, should more advice have been given on self-isolating in London? Uh, Patrick uh, Grady and the SNP didn't know last Monday um, or Tuesday that Margaret Covid had suspected or then confirmed Covid. Uh, as I understand, I think I said this on Friday, the reason that she gave for needing a proxy and travelling back home was that a family member uh, was unwell. So, yeah, I know there's an, an absolute legitimate scrutiny about who knew what when but sometimes you know it's not always the case that you know there's something lying underneath this we didn't know um until uh, wednesday uh, that she had tested positive uh, and then it wasn't until thursday that the smp group uh, at westminster and i knew that not only has she tested positive but the uh, the circumstances of her travelling to London, having been tested and then travelling back after having a positive test is what had actually occurred. So, you know, I, I think the SNP here has, in a very, very difficult, not for us, for the, the public set of circumstances that I, I absolutely am appalled at and, and still feel very angry about. We've, we've taken pretty quick, decisive um, action. Uh, in an SNP sense, she is. We've done everything we can. She's suspended from the SNP. Any further action requires to go through due process because we are bound legally by due process, like any other organisation is. In a House of Commons sense, I've made very clear. I think she should step down if she chooses not to do that, and I, I hope she will do the right thing. Then there are House of Commons procedures that uh, have to be allowed to take their course. Then, so we've acted to the maximum of what we can do uh, based on the knowledge that was uh, ha that we had at the time and I think that is uh, the uh, the reasonable thing to have done albeit in a set of circumstances I desperately wish had never occurred in the first place. Jean do you want to take on the point? On that, the family member who was unwell was the family member unwell with coronavirus or suspected coronavirus? Uh, not to my knowledge that that's not but you know I'll, I'll double check that point but not to my knowledge it, it wasn't uh, or at least that's, I don't know whether that was the situation, but that is not what uh, the, the information that Margaret Ferrier gave at the time. 
Um, Jean, do you want to take on the point about uh, older people and face coverings? Yeah, so <clears throat> I, I, I am aware, very aware, that for some people who, uh, for whom wearing a face covering is very difficult indeed because of a health condition that they have, that there is concern for some that, about how other people see them and judge them. And so we are working on a card that uh, individuals in those circumstances would be able to have. I, I hope it's almost finished its development and working out uh, how we would distribute that to those who genuinely would qualify for it without overburdening our GPs or anyone else. So we're almost completed that exercise. So I would hope it would be available to people very soon. And that's important. But what I would say as well to all of the rest of us, let's not jump to judgment if we see someone not wearing a face mask or a face covering when we're in a shop. Yes, in shops, people will ask, the, the staff may ask as you go in uh, to, for you to wear one and having that card, if you're not able to, will be very helpful. But we need to look out for each other in all of this. And as the First Minister has said many times, be kind to each other. So let's not make other people's lives more difficult than it needs to be. And let's give them the benefit of the doubt if they're not wearing a face covering, just maybe that's because it is too difficult for them to do it. Uh, Alistair Grant from the Herald. Uh, hi there, First Minister. Thanks very much. Uh, Scottish Conservative leader Douglas Ross has proposed a new fans fighting fund to help keep football clubs afloat. Uh, he's calling on the Scottish Government to match the money the fans raise to save their local teams. He said the money from the UK Government is there and that the SNP received £97 million to protect culture venues from the impact of COVID and haven't spent at least £10 million of that. I uh, just wondered what, what your response was to his proposals. And if I could just ask quickly as well, if hospitality venues are targeted in further lockdown measures, will they receive extra financial help? Well, we'll set out any uh, proposals around that when we decide and set out uh, restrictions. On the, as I understand it, Douglas Ross is uh, asking us to use the £97 million that came in consequentials for arts and culture organisations uh, for football. Now, it's important to point out that we are already going through a process of allocating that money to arts and culture organisations and the fund uh, in England uh, that generated the consequentials uh, was not for football. So if we were to use that money, we'd be taking it away from the organisations that had actually uh, been uh, intended to benefit from that money. Um, and I don't think that is the right thing to do. Um, that said, I understand uh, and absolutely um, yeah, appreciate the importance of football and the wider cultural importance of football. Uh, we are uh, we are in discussions with the UK government about separate support funding for football because we recognise that is important. And uh, Joe Fitzpatrick is, of course, meeting uh, football authorities in Scotland later this afternoon. So we will continue working to try to ensure that we are able to uh, support where appropriate football, given uh, the, the difficult situation that they, like so many other uh, other organisations are dealing with, but I don't think it would be right to take money that was deliberately earmarked for, you know, theatres and artists that can't make money right now for, for you know, cultural venues, uh, and that that is what that money was intended for, and divert that just as we're about to allocate it into football. Let's concentrate on trying to work with the UK government to get dedicated funding for football. Uh, and this is the point at which I regret admitting I hadn't read The Telegraph this morning. Daniel Sanderson from The Telegraph. Uh, thanks very much, First Minister. Um, can I just ask on the Margaret Ferrier situation? Um, she's obviously spent the weekend um, defying your very explicit call to, to stand down as an, M as an MP. Um, are you concerned that she's undermine, undermining the, the public health message? Yeah, you know, might the public be looking at this and think if, if someone in such a position of responsibility um, who's so flagrantly broken the rules is defying you in this way, you know, what, why should they follow your, your public health messages? Um, and also just secondly, on the further restrictions, um, I think you said in your opening remarks, Parliament would get a, a clear explanation on, on the rationale for any new uh, measures. Um, does that mean that they won't be getting a, a sort of formal vote on them? Or, or is that something still under consideration? Thanks. Well, let's see what the proposals are, and then we'll decide what the, the appropriate process is. But I would, you know, hope that Parliament would have not just uh, a clear explanation, but an, an input and opportunity to discuss and debate uh, whatever is, is proposed. Um, on Margaret Ferrier, look, I, I couldn't be clearer that I think she should step down as an MP. And the reason I'm clear about that is because I do think when you have, you know, 
egregious cases of people like MPs breaching the guidelines, there is a danger that it undermines the public health message. And for me right now, there is nothing more important than the integrity of the public health message. And that's why I've made it very clear to her that I think she should step down. Um, obviously, if she doesn't do that, then I, I have no power. I have no legal power. No party leader does to force that to happen. I think you know that. There are House of Commons procedures that could then be pursued, but it's probably uh, better for me to uh, let those who are in charge of these procedures uh, make those decisions rather than me try to preempt or, or be seen to influence uh, those. Um, so I'm, I'm very clear uh, here um, in my mind. The other thing I would say, oh, just, just as a contextual point, I made this point on uh, Friday, and it doesn't take away from the, the very real anger I still feel at her actions, um, but she does have COVID. Um, and when I spoke to her on Friday, she seemed uh, well in the sense that she wasn't suffering from serious symptoms. But, you know, COVID, as we know, can be a nasty illness. So I would just point out that she is currently suffering with this virus. So perhaps there is a, an element there of just uh, bearing that in mind in terms of the timing of some of this and any decisions she might arrive at. I think that concludes the questions uh, for now. Thank you uh, to uh, Jill, first of all, uh, our BSL interpreter, uh, to Gregor and Jean, to the journalists for joining us. Um, and thanks to uh, all of you who've managed to tune in and watch today. Um, as we take decisions, if we take decisions over the next few days, we will set these out as clearly and as timorously as, as we possibly can here and obviously in the Scottish Parliament. I I know nobody wants to be contemplating greater restrictions right now. I don't want to be contemplating greater restrictions, but we know from experience that getting this virus under control as quickly as possible helps to save lives. Um, and the counter to that is not acting to get it under control costs lives that would otherwise uh, be saved. So this really matters. And these decisions are not easy. They're very uh, difficult decisions for us to take, but more importantly, they're difficult decisions for you to uh, live with. Uh, and we really understand that, which is why we try to take them with as much care as possible. In the meantime, please follow the, the rules that are there just now, because they will be, um, I believe, making a difference right now, um, even if we're not yet seeing that come through in the data yet. So avoid going into other people's houses. That is really important because we know Household to household transmission is one of the, the key ways for the virus to spread. Um, if you are outdoors or in indoor public places, stick to the 6-2 limit, maximum of six people from a maximum of two households. Please work from home if you can. Uh, you know, stay off public transport if you are able to work from home and, and not make that journey to work. Download Protect Scotland app and remember facts, uh, face coverings, Avoid crowded places, clean hands and hard surface, two metres distance and self-isolate and book a test if you have symptoms. Um, this is all very tough for everybody and I, I want you to know I, I understand that uh, and it's always at the forefront of our minds when we make these decisions. We will get through this. Uh, one day we will look back on uh, COVID as something in the past, not something we're dealing with now. Uh, but while we are in it, like many other countries are having to do, we must make the right decisions to protect health and life as much as we can. Uh, thanks very much for joining us and uh, I will uh, join you uh, here I think tomorrow at 12.15 um, if we uh, were uh, taking, if we had taken decisions and I was laying them out to Parliament it may be that I join you slightly later tomorrow from Parliament but we'll try and uh, make sure that you are notified of that through social media. But for now thanks very much.